Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. Long Island City. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna make change in a place. I'm gonna go to the choir. And then, you know, I'm gonna go to parochial school and from parochial school I'm gonna go to public school. I'm gonna be in the culinary institute. I'm gonna go to Hyde Park. I'm gonna work in the Marriott Hotels. I'm gonna work in the the Essex House, the Intercontinental. Nah, maybe I'll work I'll teach at Erasmus. Nah. I really have a calling. There's a need for somebody like me. Joining the clergy at the age of 35. So who do I have today? I have the TV star, the host of Breaking Bread. I have the vicar of development for the Archdiocese, the Diocese of Brooklyn, and my buddy, Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello. Nice Irish name. Nice Irish name. <laughs> so when we got together, we were talking about your father was born in Italy, right? No, my father was born in he, Harlem. And they came to Harlem and they lived like uh, on Pleasant, near Pleasant Avenue. Near Pleasant Ave Avenue, uh, 109th Street, uh, not far from Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish. And uh, my father grew up one of ten children, five boys and five girls. And you said they went to, for showers, where? Well, on, on a Saturday, all the girls would go into the kitchen and they had their baths. And all the boys would go down to the boys' club down on First Avenue. Right, because they didn't have, uh, there was a cold water flat. There was a bathroom in the, in, the, uh, in the hallway that was shared by another apartment. And so they went there for their showers. And uh, So tell me about your grandparents. What do you know about them? Well, unfortunately, um, two of my grandparents were dead when I, by the time I was born. And then by the time I was five years old, the other two had passed away. So I really never grew up in a home with a lot of, you know, my grandparents. I had aunts and uncles. My mother was one of, uh, was an only child. Now, your mother grew up in the Ravenswood section. Ravenswood, right? Long Island City. Right. And uh, she grew up there. And uh, when um, they met, they met, in fact, in Queens at Sunnyside Gardens. In, uh, it was, what was, a place. It, was it a, uh, it was, a church social? or? Was uh, I don't think. I think they, they used to have fights there, you know, uh, boxing, boxing there. They right. had dances on Saturday. It was like a social club. Uh, it wasn't church affiliated. And uh, they met there. And when they got married, they settled in, in, in a story, Ravenswood, where my mother now, was Now, you, you said to me your dad was in the upholstery business, right? Yes. He learned the trade. By right? himself. Right. He, he was in the Army. He was in the Army. He served in, uh, in World War II. I mean, he was getting ready to go overseas, but then the war ended. 
uh, but he was there and um, he then came out of the army and one of his brothers was working uh, in an upholstery place. So he went to work for a job and he taught himself and he went, he was able to uh, build a piece of furniture from a frame. He did the cutting of the material, he did the sewing, he did the upholstering, everything. Now you said to me when your mother, uh, growing up in Queens, one of her classmates was uh, Tony Bennett, right? Yes, she went to Long Island City High School, which then became a Bryan High School, and uh, Tony Di Benedetto was their, their real name, and in fact his brother, Tony's brother, has a dealership on Northern Boulevard, and uh, you know, they were in the class together, and um, it was, you know, whenever years later she would say, oh, I went, you know, he was in school with us. So you were born when? I was born in 1959. Okay, and in Queens, In right? Queens, Astoria General Hospital. Which is now... It's uh, now part of the Beth it's, Israel... It's called Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, Queens. yes. Mount Sinai, Queens. Yes, okay. yes. So where were you living? In the Ravenswood housing? Uh, no, we didn't live in the Ravenswood houses. Uh, my mother and my father, you know, we lived uh, a couple of blocks away on 9th Street. Right. And we moved up to Crescent Street. And then uh, we moved... We moved about, I moved about five or six times by right. the time I was 12 years they, old. There were many of them with the two family homes. Right, right. And when the person sold the home, right. you had to move out. Right. We were poor. We, we, weren't, we weren't able to buy a Wait, house. You said to me you were poor, but you really didn't feel poor. No. You, you really enjoyed growing you up. You never knew it was poor. Uh, during the day, I mean, uh, at night, everyone sat outside on the stoop, and everyone took care of everyone else, and we played in the backyard, and we played in, in the garages in the back, and we'd have... Our barbecues are uh, on Saturday nights, and, and we take out the car out of the garage in the back, and we sit there if it rained inside, and the grease was on the floor, you know. <laughs> now, you went to parochial school originally. Yes. Okay. And when you were growing up, you worked in the laundromat making change. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, I was always a go-getter. I was like 11 years old, and... Um, I like construction, and those who know me now, I, I, that's what I do. I, you know, whenever I go to a parish, first thing I do is I renovate the church, I renovate the grounds, the rectory. I, I like the place to look really nice. And I guess I started from a little kid. And uh, I was like 11 years old, and on the corner was a candy store. And in those days, I had candy stores. And they closed, and they made a laundromat there. So I would watch them every day building this laundromat. And I started talking to the owner. And when they opened, I said, you have a job for me. And he said, sure. He said, on Saturdays, you come here at 9 in the morning, and you work till 12 or 1, and you sit there and you may change because they didn't have change machines then. And you had to put the change in the, in the uh, machines and the dryers. Now they have cards, you know, the credit cards. And I would sit there and I would make change. So that's 11 years old. And you got some good tips. You I got some good tips, and uh, that was my first job. So now, when you, when you were growing up, you also said you used to help pull the carpet in the... In, in the churches, and you cleaned up because you liked doing that. Well, I was in uh, parochial school, St. Patrick's uh, Catholic School in Long Island City, and um, I uh, would always help out the teacher. I was, you know, one of these uh, brown noses, I guess, and the priest and the nuns, and every year the, in the convent, the nuns would change, would pull up, they would pull up the carpets in the springtime and then put them down again in, in the fall. So, of course, I was the one to go in. I helped them move the furniture, rolled up the carpet, bring it down the basement, and brought it up. And then I became an altar server. And it's funny how I became an altar server because I wanted to join the choir. And I went up to the choir, and after the second rehearsal, the choir director, her name was Marie, and she said, uh, Jamie, why don't you uh, join the altar service? So that was the hint by saying you, right. you, you couldn't you, sing. You didn't have the best at singing. <laughs> that was, I was in, like, the fourth grade. And uh, so I became an altar server. And with that, I mean, it's funny how, you know, things work out. And with that, I became very active. I was, you know, one of the, you know, head altar servers, and I would train the others. And, of course, when the priest needed help, we would do all the decorating for the different feast days and, the, you know, all the events around the parish. And uh, so I was always, that was my start. But when you were growing up, you didn't think anywhere about the priesthood? I mean, you know. Not at a younger age, no. It didn't really start until, I would say, maybe the eighth grade or maybe high school. It was just a thought there. But, but in high school, you were already out of Catholic school. Yes. You went to Long Island City. Right. And, you know, I'm, we had to go to church on Sunday. My family... I mean, they really weren't churchgoers. I mean, they, they sent us to Catholic school, and we had all the traditions, and they would go Christmas and Easter, but they weren't regular churchgoers. 
And when we got in, when I got into high school, my brother and sister, um, they didn't go much, but I went. I went on my own. And in high school, I became a lector, Eucharistic minister. We ran retreats, and so I, I, I got involved then. Yeah, yeah. And it was and always in the back of my head. We're, but, but we're going to get there. So, but also during high school, you got a job in the catering hall, right? Well, I mean, I was a go-getter, as I said, and uh, I lived across the street from a, a, a caterer. It was called Buzzy O Caterers. They were in, in Astoria for many years. And uh, I, whenever I walked, go to school, I would pass there. So I went in there, and I asked if, you know, if they had a job for me. So I started working after school and on weekends. And what happened was during my high school days, uh, the brother of the owner, um, his name was uh, Al Buzzy was the owner, and his brother was Neil, uh, Noble, Noble was his name, and uh, he was a chef at the Culinary Institute. So um, he would come down, I would talk to him and all, and then his uh, daughter got, his niece got married, so the, a number of the chefs came down, and they came to the store and they would do all these carving, ice carvings and food carvings, and you know, they made all these pâtés and all, and I was right there helping them. So were you like a sous chef? Well, I, I got into it. You didn't know you No, that's where I, you know, I, I, I did it once or twice. And they said, you know, why don't you come to the culinary? Because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So right after high school, I, I, I went to the Culinary Institute. In New High in Hyde in Park. In Hyde Park, yes. So you were there. Uh, now, the Culinary Institute was 18 months, if I remember. Some right. It, it, actually, it was, it was um, 24 months. Right. But what but you do is you uh, go for 12 months. Then you would come back and you would work in a restaurant, like on-the-job training. So let's talk about after the first eight months right. coming back, what, what, the restaurant that you ended up at the beginning was the Essex House. Well, I went Essex for a House. job, the Essex House, and you had to get 2,000 hours of work during that three- or four-month period. So what did you do at the Essex House? Well, I went there, and I asked for a job, and uh, they gave me a job, and he, he asked me did I know how to shuck oysters, and we didn't get to that course yet at the culinary. So I said, sure, I know how to shuck oysters. <laughs> So <laughs> I show up the first day, and uh, during lunchtime, they had a, 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 um, a seafood bar in the dining room, and they had all the clams and oysters and stuff. So uh, they asked me if I would, uh, he said, okay, you know, when you can stand here when they make an order to shuck the oysters. So my first order came in, and I got the, the knife. And so the chef came over and said, I guess you don't know how to shuck oysters. I said, no, but I wanted the job. <laughs> so he taught me. And I did that for four years. Not shucking always. No, for four months. Four months. Four no, months. working in the restaurant. Right. So the, so the four months, right. okay, at the Essex House. Right. Then you go back to Then you the, go back and you, you finish up your courses. And um, you really don't come out a chef. You come out with a good foundation in so, all areas of So the, where do you go afterwards? Well, it depends on where you want to go. I know, but where'd you go? I went to the, the Carlisle Hotel. Right, and you had a lot of fun over there. Oh, it was fun. Let's talk about the different jobs you had at the Carlisle, okay. and then we'll talk about Paul Newman and uh, <laughs> uh, Hello, Dolly. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, what so happened? You first, the first job in the, in the I Carlisle. was in the kitchen. I went in there, and I got a job down in the, can in the kitchen, and I was in the pantry area. So I would, make, I would prepare the, the uh, salads and the cold appetizers, and then I would prepare the desserts. And I did that for a couple of months, and then they needed someone in room service, so I worked there as a, a room service um, supervisor. So all, I had to check all the trays and make sure everything was in order before they were sent up to the rooms. And then they needed a, a waiter in the uh, Cafe Carlisle where Bobby Short would play. And every Friday and Saturday night I worked in there, and that's where I, I learned all the uh, Cold Porter tunes. And uh, Bobby Short was a great guy. During intermission, he would come in, you know, in the back and sit with us and you know, but as a waiter, you also had to make salads, right? Sure. And then I well, went into the dining room, and I also had to, uh, you know, we would do a table, type, table side service, and we would prepare, you know, some of the dishes. We would finish them off uh, at the table. And uh, it was interesting. And funny story is when you mentioned was Paul Newman. He would come in uh, with his wife, Joanne Woodward, and I think they were, they were filming one, a movie or they were on Broadway. I don't remember. It goes back a, a long way. It was in uh, probably around the um, early 80s. And uh, so they would come in about 10 o'clock at night, and they, would, they didn't want to eat anything heavy. So they would have a nice salad. So one night he comes in. He said, you know, I think I'm going to prepare my own you know, dressing. He said, go get me some 
uh, Dijon mustard, salt, pepper, vinegar, olive oil, capers, egg yolks, and stuff. So I bring everything out. He said, put a little this, a little that. So I made it. So he did this a couple of times. So one night, I, I made the salad. I, gave, I said, Mr. Uh, Newman, I said, would you mind if I tasted it? <laughs> and he said, uh, sure. So I tasted it. And of course, in my humor, I said, uh, I think you better stick to acting. <laughs> so that was great. And then uh, I left there and I went to the Intercontinental. All of a sudden, I see Paul Newman comes out with his salad dressings. It's in all the supermarkets across the country. So when I saw that, I said, oh, I had a hand in that. Now, if you remember, that's like the, uh, the nun who told you uh, you shouldn't be in the choir. Right, right. She, <laughs> she didn't know about that. Now, Pro Bailey story when you were at Well, the, the Carlisle was a, a great hotel. I mean, a lot of stars, you know, movie stars stay there, a lot of high people. Um, James Cagney would stay there and... So what happened was uh, we, um, one night we were in the wait. It was about, in the dining room, it was about 10 o'clock, 10.30. It was a quiet night. I think it was a Sunday night. And she was in, uh, on Broadway at the time. And she came in the lobby and she wanted something from the dining room, like a, a bottle of water or something. She came in, we gave it to her. So as she was walking out, one of the other waiters said to her, uh, uh, Ms. Bailey, why don't you sing us a song? So as she was walking from the, restaurant through the lobby into the elevator she belts out hello dolly and she sings as she going and the elevator door is closing <laughs> this is you know it was a, a great memory it really so was. you leave the car line you go to the intercontinental went to the intercontinental and i there i became a restaurant manager and a catering maitre d and i worked in the french restaurant as a assistant maitre d and i did that for a couple of years but when i was there um I, I knew that going to the culinary, I still didn't have a college degree. So while I was working there six days a week, I then joined, I, I entered Baruch College, and I got my BA in business administration. So I was working and going to college, and I got my BA, and then in 1987, always involved in the church, always doing things, and working long hours and weekends, I was tired of it. I left there to teach at Erasmus. So, because it was 9 to 5, basically, Monday through Friday, I had weekends off, and it gave me more time to do things at the church on weekends, and uh, so, uh, and that was always in the back of my mind, and I went, I taught for three years at Erasmus Hall, and all during, even, you know, working at the hotel. I dated, I traveled, I, I was making money, but there was always something. There was something the there, and you also had, and you had a mentor uh, who became one of your best friends. Yes, Monsignor Monsignor David, David Casado. He's a pastor of Saint Athanasius Church in Brooklyn. I, I knew him from my. I was in the eighth grade at uh, at uh, Saint Patrick's when he was assigned to Saint Rita's in Long Island City, with the next parish. And at the time, I was working for the caterer. He would come in and order different things for uh, the parish. And that's when he asked me to join Confraternity, which was a Wednesday night um, meeting of teenagers. And we would come, we would have a half an hour of, uh, you know, prayer and sharing. And then there would be like an hour of recreation. And then we would have trips and all. So that's really where I got involved in the church and, and got more involved with when he came there. And we became friends. And we were friends throughout our lives. And... Um, so when, when do you get the calling that you wanted to start? To well, I mean, doing all these different things and always having that um, thought in the back of my mind, and now more and more people seeing me active in the church saying to me, Jamie, when are you going to join the seminary? Why don't you become a priest? It finally, you know, it sank in. and it. Uh, so you joined the seminary when, 80? I joined the seminary in 1990. 1990. I just 19. turned 30. Right. Yes. So you joined the seminary in 1990, five, four and a half years later? Uh, yes. Five years later, I was um, ordained at 35. So then where do you go? I was assigned to St. Patrick's in Bay Ridge. And uh, that was my first assignment. And I remember when I got my assignment on ordination day, and I said I was going to uh, Monsignor Patrick Fursey O'Toole. And a couple of guys said, oh, he's a tough pastor. So I said, ah, make the best of it. And I was signed there for five years. I got very involved in the community. I started the Taste of the Ridge, 
which, you know, of course, my food background, there were many restaurants in Bay Ridge at that time. Right, and you even have your own wine. Right. Well, that came later on. Okay. But at that time, um, Bay Ridge was the only area in Brooklyn that had any restaurants or a nightlife, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit in um, Brooklyn nice. Heights, but nothing else anywhere else. And um, so I got all the restaurants together, and we had it as a fundraiser for the parish. And uh, my pastor let me get involved in the community. He let me do a lot of things that, you know, a lot of guys wouldn't let you do. And then you go to Mill Basin? Then after five years, I was transferred because they had this rule at the time that after five years, you have to get a different experience, a different pastor, a different, you know, congregation, because every place is different. And after that, I went there, and um, I was there for, I was very upset. I cried for about a year because I had to leave Bay Ridge. I had to go to this area. It was like living in the suburbs. And uh, great people, the people, I mean, that's what really counts. But after a year there, the pastor resigned. Hopefully not anything to do with me being there as his associate. But uh, he, pa he uh, resigned, and the bishop asked me after six years of only being uh, ordained six years to be the pastor. So I became the pastor there, and I enjoyed every moment of it. And uh, I was there for about uh, 12 years. And then I was transferred to the neighboring parish of St. Bernard and uh, in uh, Bergen Beach, Mill Basin area. And I already knew so many of the business people in the area already, so I was very much involved in the community. So I was really in that community for about 16 years. Until recently. Until. But, and then recently you've gone now to Williamsburg. Williamsburg. Uh, the parish there, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which I was very much involved because when uh, Monsignor Casado left St. Rita's, he went there, and he was there for 17 years. And it was during those days that when he got there that I helped out with the feast, that I joined the seminary and became a priest. So I was there for a lot of my formation life. And uh, then he got transferred in 2001 on 9-11, the same day of 9-11. But um, he, um, so we really haven't gone back much. And uh, so now... Um, about last year, they were looking for a new pastor there because the other pastor was uh, leaving there, and they needed someone really to reach out to the new people, the hipsters in the neighborhood. So let's talk about the hipster, uh, you know, the Monsignor to the hipsters. How do, you, <laughs> how do you decide to get involved with the TV show? Well, that went back about five, six years ago. Uh, they were revamping our prayer channel, and they wanted to revamp it to you know, make it more appealing uh, to, to people. They wanted to have more human interest stories. Baking bread? Breaking bread. So they wanted to do something with food. So, of course, the priest that cooks, they knew I went to the culinary. Um, so they asked me if I would do the show, Breaking Bread. And uh, some people call it Breaking Chops. But, <laughs> but you originally started going to restaurants, right? Well, the first show, what we do is we would, we would visit a parish and we would, you know, and of course, Brooklyn is filled with different ethnic neighborhoods. And very, very, uh, many of the parishes have different ethnic uh, congregations and languages. On Sunday, Mass is celebrated in about 28 different languages. So we would visit the parish, talk about the congregation and the people that are there, and then ask them what restaurants that they would go to. So we would tell a little story about the church, the history of the church, and then go visit the restaurant. And over the years, the show's been on about six years, we kind of, you know, moved away from that, not so much with the restaurants, with the churches, but more with the restaurants. And then at the end, I would do some cooking, and we would highlight some of the people in our diocese that do different things, or some uh, restaurants that really help out charities and do different things. There was a restaurant, a pizzeria in Philadelphia, that every time someone comes in, they give a dollar extra to feed a homeless person. So, I mean, we, we try to do all these different uh, goodwill stories and human interest and stories. And when did you become the vicar? Well, uh, I became the vicar about seven years ago when the bishop came to the parish of Mary, Queen of Heaven, and it was a poor parish. I mean, it, it was uh, poor financially, but rich in, in, in people in the sense that it was old-time Irish and Italian, and they were very faithful and devoted to their parish. 
And then we had a tremendous amount of new people in the area, Caribbean people from Haiti. And, you know, it was a vibrant parish. Uh, I renovated every building. The church was, you know, in good shape. Financially, we were doing well. And the bishop was very impressed by the work that I did in this poor parish. And um, so he, he asked me um, about six months later after visiting there if I would become the vicar for development. And that means to, be, uh, to oversee all the different fundraisings uh, in the Brooklyn Diocese. Brooklyn. Then there's the Futures in Education, and then there's also the Catholic Foundation for Brooklyn and Queens. Futures is, uh, was started about 25 years ago. And over the last 25 years, we have given out over $90 million in scholarships to children that are in need, that wish to come to Catholic schools, their parents want them to come to Catholic schools, but financially they can't swing it. They have to turn in their tax papers, their, their, you know, their tax returns, and the maximum total household income has to be $30,000. Uh, $30, anything over that, they don't qualify. And we have about a little under 30,000 students in our grammar schools. A third of them are in fall under that uh, poverty line and re are receiving scholarships. We, we were talking earlier about outreach. I mean, now you're in Williamsburg. So how are you doing some outreach, which is one of your specialties? Well, I mean, I think just as a priest, um, you have to be open to people. And I have to say, going into seminary at 30 years old uh, was a great advantage to me because I was out in the world. I knew where people, you know, I know where people are at. I had to be financially dependent. You know, I even help, you know, my family out. Um, you're out there in the world. You see how people live. I dated. I traveled. I made money. You know what life is about. And when you become a priest and people come to you with different situations and problems and issues, at least you can relate to them. And I feel that that has given me an, an, the ability to be very open to people and try, you know, like Pope Francis says, you know, we're not there to analyze people or to judge people. You know, he, he just mentioned a couple of months ago that, you know, when you see a beggar in the, tr in the street or a homeless person, don't think, you know, what, don't help them, don't give them, don't give them any money because you feel they're going to use it for drugs or alcohol. Just give it to them. If they need it, they have it. More than likely, if they're in that position, they need it in one, one way or the other. And I think you have to just be open to people and now I, I think also with the, the, um, the hipsters, they are people that more than likely they were born or they were raised in some faith. And the seed is there, but because of whatever, they have lost it. We have to try to first communicate with them, talk to them, get to know them, so that maybe you can ignite that seed a little bit, that fire in them and bring them back. They have questions. Let's hear them. So I'm happy to say that I'm happy the calling took place at the age of 30. Right. And you, you, you have been doing a great job in the community, and everybody knows Monsignor Jamie, and I'm happy to have you today, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much.